All right, so the memory system in GEM5 is broken down into two main components, the first of which is the memory controller, which is what interacts with the port and will receive all the read and write requests through packets. And then we also have the memory interface. Um, so <clears throat> what happens when the memory controller receives a packet from the port is it places it into a read or write queue um, and then applies some scheduling algorithm which currently in GEM5 there is first come first served and first row first come first served um, and it will use the scheduling algorithm to figure out uh, which request in the queue will be uh, accessed next and so on. Meanwhile the memory interface implements all the architecture and timing parameters of the chosen memory type. Um, so this will have all of our uh, uh, TRAS, TCAS, those types of things. Um, and it also manages the media specific operations uh, such as activation, pre-charge, refresh, low power modes, and, and others. <clears throat> so uh, the memory controllers in GEM5 um, all uh, are, come from QoS mem control. We have three main types of memory controllers. We have the uh, main sort of, or the default memory controller here, which can connect to one uh, interface. That could be a DRAM interface or an MVM interface. Then we also have the heterogeneous memory controller, which has two interfaces, one of which is DRAM and one of which is MVM. So we can have uh, implement heterogeneous memory that way. Then we also have our HBM2 controller, uh, which connects to two different HBM2 interfaces to model the pseudo channels of HBM2. The memory interfaces, on the other hand, um, are uh, inherent from mem interface and use just two different types of interfaces that we use. The MVM interface, which currently just has one MVM model. Uh, which is, I believe, very loosely based off of uh, 3D crosspoint type of uh, architecture. And then we also have uh, many types of uh, DRAM interfaces. We have DDR, LPDDR, GDDR, HMC, Wide.io, as well as HBM that all fall under that DRAM interface category. Um, so actually, we will real quick take a quick look at um, the DRAM interface and see how the timing parameters are implemented. So we will go to gem5 source mem and find DRAM interface. <coughs> so the things we notice when we look into the DRAM interface class, um, we see all of the timing parameters available, and there's a lot of them. So we have RASTICAS uh, read delay, RASTICAS write delay. Uh, there's the clock in there as well. Uh, read cast latency, write cast latency, and so on. Uh, lots of uh, timing parameters uh, to fill in here. And if we look at some examples that are already implemented, if we scroll down, such as this DDR3 interface, um, we can see one uh, all of these values are filled in and how they're filled in. And there's also an explanation of above each of these values that explains how these values were calculated and why they are. Um, and most of them come from uh, data sheets and they specify which data sheets they come from too generally. So the memory controller is responsible for scheduling and issuing all the read and write requests out of the queues. Um, and it obeys the timing parameters that it gets from the memory interface that it is connected to. Uh, these timing parameters are tracked per bank, um, which, and which means uh, each bank will have their own sort of things being tracked so that they can be accessed simultaneously. And we use GEM5 events to schedule once a, a bank finishes accessing something and is free for its next access. And we'll talk more about GEM5 events uh, later on. So as we've said earlier, uh, yesterday, the models aren't cycle accurate, but they are cycle level, as we could see with the timing parameters that we have implemented, which uh, are all based off of the, the clock cycles of the, the uh, DRAM interface we're implementing. Um, but they are still quite accurate compared to other DRAM simulators, such as DRAM sim and DRAM sys. Now you are able to extend the uh, memory interfaces that we have. For example, if you wanted to add a DDR6 or something, or if you're trying to make your own. However, that's 
usually pretty co complicated to design your own uh, DRAM interface, and generally you'll most likely be using what we have already implemented. <clears throat> and the main way that we do configure Gem5's mem memory is changing the number of channels, as well as the channel rank, bank, row, column bits, um, since systems rarely use bespoke memory devices. So now we're going to talk about memory in the standard library. So the standard library wraps the memory models into what it calls memory systems, um, which contains both the memory controller and the memory interface. Um, and many examples are already implemented for us, and you can check them out um, in the standard library section in the multi-channel.py or in single-channel.py, which we'll look at in a couple of slides. And additionally, uh, there's a uh, simple memory which is added to the standard library, which allows the user to not worry about timing parameters and instead just give a desired latency, bandwidth, latency variation, and the size of your memory. So this would most likely be if you're trying to model something that's not super dependent on the memory or you just, maybe you want to say if I have a, a system that's not memory bound, I have super high ba latent or bandwidth coming from the memory, uh, what, what does the rest of the system look like? But if you're trying to do interesting memory stuff, you will most likely not be using the simple memory. Uh, we then have channel memory, which is what encompasses the other memory system. So this is where we have both the controller and the interface combined for our DDRs, HBMs, and so on. Um, channel memory provides a very simple way to use multiple memory channels um, and also handles things like the scheduling policy and interleaving for you, which we'll go over interleaving later on in this presentation as well. All right, so now we're gonna go to a little bit of coding. Uh, most of the files are uh, mostly already set up, so we just have to add a couple lines of code to, to set up the memory. So um, the first thing to notice is that the files we're using are using traffic generators. Um, and we're going to first start by adding the uh, single channel simple memory. So we will go to uh, materials. So we're going to first open up this run mem.py. Um, and for those who did not get a chance to, to rebase this morning, if this line is not commented it out, please comment that out, otherwise you will get an error. Um, and we'll come back to that and uncomment it out later. So, all right, and then we're gonna go down to whoop, right here, and we will set up our single channel, simple memory. Um, we gotta set a latency, 50 nanoseconds a bandwidth, uh, which we will say is 32 gigabytes per second, um, latency variation, give 10 nanoseconds, and size we will give uh, eight, 8 gigabytes. Whoop. And now we can run this with gem5 run mem. Cool. So what this program tells us the actual bandwidth we achieved with this memory. And we see, uh, first of all, this bandwidth is in gigabytes per second, not gigabytes per second. So that's why it's higher than what we had put in. Um, it's just because it's, it's uh, giving us a value in base 10 instead of base 2. Um, so we see that the simple memory performs with its uh, full bandwidth utilization. We told it to, to run at that bandwidth, and it was able to do so. Um, now we want to look back and, and try to change that to, to model a, a more realistic memory. Um, and also, I should have added this script, has the ability to run linear generator or random generator with the command line argument dash c or you can change the read percentage of our generator with uh, dash r. 
Um, and then also you can use dash B to uh, set the bandwidth of the traffic generator itself. So we'll actually real quick run it one more time, but with some of these flags. So So we're going to run it once with a linear generator and a read, uh, read percentage set to 50. And we see the, the same sort of uh, bandwidth values there, 34 gig gigabytes per second. And we're going to run it again with read 100. Um, normally, we would expect read 100 to perform better than uh, read 50 uh, due to the uh, uh, write to read turnaround or read to write turnaround, um, but we see here that they actually give us the exact same performance as this is a very simple memory that's not modeling the complexities that would normally affect performance with something like that. Um, so we have some some numbers here. Uh, so the bandwidth in the left column is what we set the traffic generators uh, bandwidth to. So we can see uh, because our memory was only set to 32 uh, gigabytes per second. That's the value it stayed even when our traffic generator was uh, pumping in traffic at a speed of 64 gigabytes per second. Um, and the other thing to note, because it's simple and not complex, we see the read percentage doesn't change the performance anywhere. And also, linear traffic or random traffic also doesn't change the performance anywhere, which is not what we would generally expect from a memory system. So now we are going to try adding a more uh, complex memory system. So as I mentioned earlier, all of the channel memories are in uh, this single channel.py as well as uh, dual channel.py. And we're going to be implementing this single channel DDR4 into our system. Um, so we're going to go ahead and replace that single channel simple memory that we added and just replace it with single channel DDR4 uh, 2400. So we will do that now. And this we can also set the, the size to in here as well. All right. So now we're going to run through uh, the same sort of test. So first linear traffic generator with a read percentage of 50. And we see that it only gets 13 gigabytes per second, uh, much lower than, than that of the simple memory due to the, the complexities that it's modeling affecting the performance. And then if we run it again with a read percentage of 100, we do see an improvement in performance by about 800 megabytes per second, which is to be expected if we have a, a workload that's doing all reads. We should be seeing higher bandwidth than if we have uh, half reads and half writes. So we once again have the uh, similar sort of data. Um, but this time, we notice one, uh, as we change the read percentage, that does affect the uh, achieved bandwidth, um, both when it's at 16 gigabytes per second as well as 32. And then we also now see that there's a difference between linear and random um, traffic generations. Uh, normally, we would expect the random traffic generation to result in lower performance. However, uh, we do think that in this case, the, the number of banks that this memory has is enough to, to handle this random traffic efficiently. Cool. All right. So yes, uh, we're looking at adding a new channel memory now. So let's say you wanted to, to uh, look at LPDDR and how it's changed throughout the years, and you're looking into using Gem5 for it. However, when you go to the standard library, um, gem5 source Python oh, components memory and we look at the single channel.py and we see all the the memories that are here um, if we scroll through we'll notice that there is lpddr3 um, but there's no lpddr2 so even though we already have that DRAM interface here um, there is just currently no channeled memory for it in uh, the standard library. So in order to do that, uh, we are first going to 
uh, open up this file that we have in uh, the memory uh, folder here and lpddr2.py and we want to add it. So first we need to import all of the, the packages that we need to inherit and stuff. So uh, this block here, um, we will first need to inherit, or I mean import. So LPDDR2. I'm going to import those, and then after that, we can, as with uh, before, we can define our single channel LPDDR2, um, and it should look something like this, where this channel memory's arguments are one, the DRAM interface we're using, the number of channels we have, um, in this case one, because it's single channel, the interleave size, and the size of the memory itself. So. Yeah, we will single channel LPDDR2. And just like that, we now have our LPDDR2 module. So now if we go back to run mem.py and we uncomment that line that I had us all comment out earlier, that's just importing that single channel LPDDR2. Um, and now we should be able to replace memory with single channel LPDDR2. And now we can run that again <coughs> and see that we have now successfully implemented a channeled memory for LPDDR2. And as it's a much older memory technology, we can see it performs much worse than that of DDR4. Cool. So that is how we add our own channeled memories once we have the memory interface within GEM5. Are there any questions about that? And it, it should be noted that if you wanted to set up a memory that was two channels, you could do the same thing in the dual channel, um, change the, the title of the class, and then just change this from a one to a two, and it would do everything else for you, and now you'd have a dual channel version of, of that same memory. No? All right, cool. So next I'm going to talk a little about a little bit about comm monitors um, or communication monitors, which are a SIM object in GEM5 that are used to monitor communication between um, two ports. A uh, key thing about it is it has no effect on the actual timing, so it won't slow down your system at all, but you can use it to, to try to learn more to help debug, figure out where your bottlenecks are in your system. Um, and you can find the source code or like the parameters you can pass to it here. So, First, we're going to look at a very simple system, and actually the system we have, we have implemented uses generators, not the timing simple CPU. Um, but yeah, we're going to look at this commonitor.py, and it's a simple system with a generator, an L1 cache, a crossbar, and a memory controller and interface. So we will... Um, and also, the code for this one might look a little different as it's not using the standard library, but I will tell you what you need to add and where. Um, but yeah, so right now that's the, the system. We can uh, run it if we wish to. I don't know why that got copied there. But, um, Gem5 com monitor 
Um, so it, it runs as is right now, and we can go ahead and look at uh, the stats for this system. Um, and, and yeah, so but now let's say for whatever reason we wanted to see exactly what was happening for all the data that gets past the L1 um, before it gets to the crossbar, or you can imagine a system where you might want to input it between an L1 and an L2 to look at the, the actual communication that's going on there. And it will ret return a bunch of helpful stats, such as the average or the latency and a histogram of all the latency of requests that went through it, as well as bandwidth and things like that, which, like I said, makes it very useful for debugging, especially if you're doing memory related research and you're trying to figure out where the bottleneck is in your system. Um, so we are going to go ahead and add. Um, we're going to go ahead and add our com monitor, and the way we are going to do that, uh, we're going to add it right between the L1 cache and the system crossbar. So we're going to look at where previously the L1 cache was connected to the membus, which is the crossbar. We're going to remove that and replace it with this, where we will create a com monitor, set one of its ports, the CPU side, to the L1 cache, and its mem side port over to the membus. And then doing this, we'll have su successfully implemented a COM monitor in between these two ports um, that won't affect performance. So I'm just going to copy that. And we want to get rid of this line and replace it with that. And now I will rerun it. <coughs> and this time, when we look at the, the stats, We'll see there all these stats under the COM monitor, which has, like I said, a lot of useful stats, such as uh, a histogram of read bandwidth, as well as the, the average read bandwidth we get. Um, same with write bandwidth, how many bytes are read, and, and so on. So these stats are really useful for debugging, and I highly recommend using this, this tool if you are doing memory research and trying to figure out where a bottleneck is. As we had mentioned before, if you're using this simple cache and you're worried that a crossbar or something is slowing you down, you could do something like imp imp inputting a COM monitor on either side of the crossbar to see what your bandwidth going into it is, as well as coming out of it, and things like that. So very useful tool. All right. All right, next I'll talk about address interleaving. So uh, the idea behind address interleaving is we want to be able to parallelize our memory accesses as much as we can. Um, for example, we can parallelize across multiple banks or channels um, by accessing them at the same time. And particularly, this will be focusing on uh, address interleaving across channels. Um, so the way we do this is we use part of the address as a selector to choose which channel we are trying to access. Um, in, in doing this, we have a contig contiguous address uh, range that can be interleaved across channels. So if we think about like a linear traffic generator, instead of you accessing all of one channel and then all of another and then all of another, we can actually spread those uh, accesses across all of them so that we're using as much of the memory as we can at any given time. So an example of how this could be done is let's say we have some address here. Um, we have two selector bits because we have four channels. Um, and these selector bits are, are calculated by taking the XOR of the ninth bit of the address and the 12th bit, as well as the 14th bit and the 18th bit. Um, and in doing this, uh, we now have, uh, for a given address, which bank or, cha or which channel it's going to access. And as we access more, we're going to be spreading it across all these different channels. Um, so as far as how this is done in GEM5, uh, it's mostly done within the address range constructor, uh, which you can see in source space address range.hh. And actually, in the standard library, this is already done for you whenever you use one of the channeled memories. So uh, you probably don't We're not going to run through a coding example of this, because if you're using the standard library, you most likely won't have to do this on your own. But it's important to cover anyways. Um, so the two constructors that we have for doing address interleaving, um, the first one looks like this, where we have a start address, an end address, and also you can alternatively give it a start and a size. Um, and then you have some masks, which is deciding which bits you're going to XOR with each other for your selector. Um, and then the interleave match is used to, if we have four channels, it's saying which channel it is. So 
four channels, you'd have one, in, one address range have an interleave match of zero, then one, then two, then three. Um, and then the other constructor we have, which is our, our sort of legacy constructor, once again uh, has this start, end, or size, and interleave match. But instead, we have to just uh, actually say how many bits we want to be like used for interleaving. So this is usually based on how many channels you have. Um, and then we have this interleave high bit and XOR high bit. And then we, this is the calculation that is done to, to figure out which uh, channel you are actually using. Cool. So we're going to quickly take a look. And like I said, we won't be doing any actual coding of it ourselves. But we're going to look at where it's already done for us in the standard library. So if we go back to our standard library, gem5 source, Python, gem5 components, memory, and it's here in this memory.py. So we are going to All right, so we have this, this function in here called interleave addresses. And if we go ahead and look at it, um, first of all, we'll see here is the actual constructor where it's doing the address interleaving. Um, and something to notice is that these uh, interleave bits, as I said before, is based on the, the number of channels. So it's a log uh, two of the number of channels. So four channels, two bits, and, and, and so on. So, <clears throat> then we have our, our high bit and our low bit. Uh, XOR high bit is set to zero. Um, and then we have these bits, which are or the interleave low bit, or yeah, which is calculated based on the address mapping that we're using. And doing this, the standard library does this all for you, so don't have to worry about it. But if you end up going past the standard library and want to get the best use out of your memory, uh, you'll probably want to do some interleaving like this.